Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. It is 2.30, and in an effort to protect your time, why don't we get started? Just before I introduce our pre presenters, I do want to let you know that this session is being recorded for educational purposes, and I have muted all lines at this point in time just to minimize background noise and distraction, uh, but there will be an opportunity for questions at the end of this session. So at that point in time, you can either unmute your own lines or write in through the chat box, which is located at the bottom of your toolbar. Uh, please join me in welcoming our speakers, Melissa McVie, OARC's Education and Home Support Facilitator, and Samantha Peck, Director of Communications and Educations with Family Councils Ontario. Over to you, ladies. Thanks for the warm welcome, Josie Lee. We are very pleased to be speaking with the, this great group this afternoon. And in our roles as educators with our respective organizations, Sam and I are often approached with questions about how residence council and family councils are different and why they need to be maintained as separate groups. As a response to these common questions and others, we've joined forces today to help shed some light on these important areas and hopefully we'll be able to clarify some of the confusion. Good afternoon, everyone. So during our time together, this is what we're going to be discussing. We are going to describe the respective roles and responsibilities of family councils and residence councils. And then to put what we've learned through this into practice, we're going to use a long-term care home based scenario in which we'll explore how family councils and residence councils are similar and different. So key distinctions and similarities. Then we'll explore and unpack when and why the councils need to be separate. And then we're going to identify those important opportunities for collaboration between family councils and residence councils. Thanks, Sam. We're going to kick off today's session with a quick poll that should be popping up on your screens momentarily. The question reads, does your home have an established residence council and family council? Okay, and the answers, the possible answers were resident council only or both councils are established. And I think we'll just give it another moment. Okay, it's closed now. Thanks, Josie Lee. As anticipated, most of you have expressed that your homes have both a residence council and a family council established. Today, as Sam mentioned, we'll focus on distinguishing these two groups and identify some opportunities for working together. And on the next two slides, we're going to spend a few minutes introducing OARC and Family Councils Ontario. So what or who is OARC? Or the Ontario Association of Residence Councils, or OARC for short, is a nonprofit association formed by a group of residents back in 1981. We are funded by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, and we also receive funding through membership dues. OARC represents the collective voice of all residents living in long-term care through their respective residence councils. And as part of our mandate, we provide education and tools to support the formation and the operation of residence councils that are both effective and sustainable. We encourage residents through council involvement to be part of discussions and decisions that impact their lives. OARC also works to educate our partners and the broader community about issues experienced by residents living in long-term care homes. Pictured on this slide, we have our working board of directors, all of whom live in OARC member homes throughout Ontario. Our board provides the leadership and guidance for our association based on their lived experiences as residents. We also have a fun photo here of the OARC team, 
including myself on the left, Jennifer Langston, Client Relations and Project Manager, Dee Lender, Executive Director, Julie Garvey, Administration and Finance Manager, and Josie Lee Gibson, Education and Community Engagement Manager. Like OARC, Family Councils Ontario, or FCO, is funded by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Now, we're an independent, charitable, not-for-profit, originally established as Family Councils Project back in 1998, funded by a, tr a Trillium Foundation grant. FCO is now celebrating its 21st year working with Family Councils and Long-Term Care Homes across Ontario. We have a board of directors who is made up of a mix of family council members from across Ontario and community members who are passionate about supporting our mission to lead and support families in improving quality of life in long term care. And how we do that is by working collabor collaboratively with our partners to cultivate effective family councils, partners such as OARC. We also do a lot of work to advance public policy and system planning and mobilize knowledge exchange. And all of that is done through bringing forward and listening to the aligned voices of family councils and family caregivers across Ontario. So now we're going to get into the meat of our contact. That's the roles of councils. So how are family and residence councils similar and what's different? So we'll start by talking about a res residence council. According to the Long-Term Care Homes Act, every licensee of a long-term care home must ensure that a residence council is established at the home. A residence council is an independent, self-determining group exclusive to residents only. If we look at the Resident Bill of Rights, resident right number 20 states that all residents have the right to, be, to participate in the Residence Council. The Council is intended and designed to be a formal advisory group of residents representing the collective voice of all residents who reside in the long-term care home, whether or not they are attending meetings. The Resident Council meets regularly to provide advice and recommendations to the home's leadership regarding what residents would like to see done to enhance the resident experience, including care, programs, and overall quality of life. Meetings are safe spaces where residents can come together on that regular basis for peer support and sharing. Resident Council meetings provide an opportunity for residents to celebrate what's working well in the home and to identify areas where improvements may be needed. A family council is defined as an organized, self-led, self-determining and democratic group composed of the family and friends of the residents of a long-term care home. Like residence councils, family councils are in the legislation governing long-term care, the Long-Term Care Homes Act in which it says that every home may have a family council. Now that's one of the key distinctions we're going to be unpacking between family and residence councils. You'll see there's a difference in what the legislation says, and in part that's due to the fact that you can't force families to meet to form a family council, though the vast majority of long-term care homes do in fact have a family council. Now while family councils across the province will often differ, they do share one common goal, and that is, above all, to improve the quality of life of residents in that home. Also, family councils give the families and friends of residents a forum or a safe space for sharing their experiences, learning and exchanging information. And they usually have four goals they undertake to do so. That's peer support for members, education for members on issues affecting them and their loved ones, communication and teamwork amongst family members and between families and the home, and effective problem solving. Now, as I said, like councils often differ, both family and residence councils have a few key characteristics they share in common. 
So both groups, family and residence councils, come together and interact as members regularly. They'll have a, they'll share a sense of belonging or purpose. So for family councils, it's to enhance the quality of life and care for residents. These groups will also have common goals and objectives amongst themselves. So they'll agree as a council on what they want to pursue. And whether formal or more informal, they'll have some degree of structure, rules, and methods of operation that members agree on as to how they'll carry out their work. So on this next slide, we have a diagram that helps to visually illustrate the distinct council groups while also identifying some of the shared powers and responsibilities that which we'll touch on shortly. In addition to having separate meetings and separate membership bases, the purpose of the councils are slightly different as distinguished distinguished by the language used in the Long-Term Care Homes Act. A residence council provides advice and recommendations to the licensee on care and quality of life, whereas a family council provides assistance, information and advice to residents and family members of residents. Some of the shared powers of the councils are highlighted in the overlapping middle bubble or circle of this diagram. Firstly, councils can develop an information sheet or a brochure to include in the home's move-in or admission package. This tool can be used to relay important information that the councils would like new residents and families to know about, about the council or how to get involved, etc. Council is intended to be a vehicle through which disputes can be resolved. The follow-up communication from the home's administrator after each respective council meeting, which often comes in the form of an action plan or a written acknowledgement, helps to assure residents and families that their identified concerns are being heard and that their feedback is being considered in the resolution of issues. Another power of both councils is their ability to plan and sponsor activities or events of interest above and beyond the home's planned activity offerings or calendar of events. Councils might also choose to partner and collaborate with community groups and volunteers on specific initiatives of their choosing. I think Sam has a few more powers. Um, councils, both family and residence councils, have the the right or the power to review reports, so financial, audited financial statements, inspection reports, and so on. Family and residence councils also both have the power to be involved in the mission statement of the home. So that's in development and review. And it provides a really important opportunity for the lived experiences and the voices of families and residents to be centered in what the home is communicating to its clients and to the public as well. As well, satisfaction surveys. Now these are important measures of the satisfaction with the care services and so on happening within the home. So family councils and residence councils both have the the right to be involved in developing, carrying out, and acting on the results of these satisfaction surveys. So this is an important obligation or duty of the home to have these groups involved in that because then it really does ensure that what's happening in the home is meeting the needs of residents and families and that actions taken to improve the satisfaction are rooted in the lived experiences of residents and families. All right, next we're gonna be jumping into another poll for the group, and it's true or false. We'll let Josie Lee launch that for you. The Long-Term Care Homes Act prohibits residents council and family councils from working together. True or false? Well, you've got 100% of respondents saying false, which is the correct answer. This is a common misconception that the councils are prohibited from collaborating. Despite being two distinct groups in the home, there are lots of ways that resident councils and family councils can work together in meaningful ways. 
and we'll be unpacking this further in the next section. First, I wanted to, to touch on the role of the administrator. The home's administrator plays an important role when it comes to setting the tone and creating an environment in the home that supports open communication and collaboration. As captured in the Long-Term Care Homes Act, the administrator has the responsibility to consult with both the Residence Council and Family Council on an ongoing basis. At minimum, that means every three months or at least quarterly. The administrator can request an invitation to present at an upcoming council meeting or the council's leadership teams may choose to extend an invitation to the administrator if they have something specific that they'd like to discuss. This ongoing communication helps to build and strengthen relationships. It also, it's also important that the leaders in every home, especially the administrator, are knowledgeable and they have a strong sense of understanding of the legislation surrounding residence council and family councils. And they need this in order to fulfill their own roles and responsibilities to the respective councils and to best support them on that ongoing basis. The administrator is also in a very unique position to identify opportunities to support and encourage collaboration between the councils to maximize outcomes and foster a sense of community within the home. We'll revisit this idea and what it might look like after the next few slides. Like the home administrator, council assistants play an important role in supporting residents and family councils. There's a specific provision in the legislation that the home administrator or licensee shall support an assistant to each council if desired. Council assistants can be value, valuable supports to the councils and can help enhance collaboration. According to the legislation, the council assistant must be acceptable to council. And further, the assistant is not a member of the council. They take direction from and report to their respective councils. So they're not members of the council, but they can be valuable supports in helping these two councils do their best work. So we're going to launch right into our third and final poll today which is another true and false question. And that reads, assistance to the residence council and family council can share information regarding council meetings, activities and goals with the other council. I'm seeing a mix of response popping up there in the polls. Perhaps my wording is a bit misleading here because the correct answer is in fact false. So I think we were missing a, an important piece of the context. Sharing information would be considered a breach of confidentiality unless the council leaders give direction to the assistant and give that approval to share specific information or details on their behalf. It is imperative that the staff assistant is someone that the council can trust and that commitment to maintaining respectful communication and confidentiality is a big, big part of that. So I think it was the wording in this case that might have thrown a few of your responses off. Um, so inf information sharing can be a great thing, but it needs to happen um, under the direction from the respective councils. So there's got to be a formalized a process and approval for that to happen. So. I figured this was a good time to tackle some other common areas of confusion and hopefully offer some clarification. Uh, both OARC and Family Councils Ontario receive a lot of questions surrounding council membership and participation, including meeting attendance. For example, can a family member accompany a resident to attend a resident's council meeting in any of the following cases? if the resident is living with cognitive changes, if there is a language barrier present, if the family member is curious about residence counsel, and quite simply, the answer to these questions across the board and in all other cases is no. 
Um, I would be remiss if I did not take this moment to acknowledge the new reality that residence councils are operating in. There is an increasingly large number of residents living and moving into long-term care with cognitive changes and complex care needs. Despite this, this changing reality, the Long-Term Care Homes Act is very clear that the Residence Council is for residents only. In order to ensure that council meetings are inclusive of residents who may be living with cognitive changes, sensory changes, or perceived communication barriers, resident council leaders and their assistants must work together to find some new and innovative ways to engage the residents who choose to attend the meetings and be active participants. Councils must work hard to best represent and advocate for those who may not be present at the meetings as well, either by choice or by circumstance. So to make, make these meetings more accessible and inclusive, the council may pre-approve the utilization of a volunteer translator. For example, if a resident requires or requests this in order to follow along at a meeting. The assistant might also acquire a pocket talker to help a resident who is hard of hearing to better participate, or a council might implement the use of a microphone or other audio visuals at a meeting to enhance the resident experience. Meeting agendas and minutes can be printed with large font text to make them more accessible to a broader range of residents. And outside of the council meetings and between meetings, work is also being done. Resident leaders all get to know family members of residents and team members and through ongoing discussions, issues might come to light that can be brought forward at council meetings on a resident's behalf, with their permission, of course. And this leads me to another common question or area for clarification. There seems to be some confusion around the interpretation of resident right number 27. Every resident has the right to have a friend, family member, or other person of importance to, um, to that resident attend any meeting with the licensee or the staff of the home. Now, once again, the answer is no. And this, in this particular context with resident right number 27, we're referring to meetings with the home, such as a care conference. And this is excluding resident council meetings. In the case of council membership and participation, the act is clear that family members have their family council and residents have their residence council. The meetings are respectively private meetings. There is a provision for guests to be pre-approved. If the council is presented with a request for a guest to attend, then they can decide beforehand if this is appropriate. Through the work that OARC has done over the years and based on the insights shared by many of the councils we have supported and through ongoing consultation with our OARC board of directors, there is wide consensus on this protective notion of holding and maintaining private meetings. Residents have told us time and time again that sharing sensitive issues or speaking openly about certain topics is hindered or com halted completely when staff or family members are present at meetings. The meetings are intended to be private for residents only so that there is a culture of peer-to-peer -peer support, understanding and openness that simply can't be nurtured with guests regularly attending meetings. This is the reason that residents need a form to share privately. And I think Sam, uh, Sam's going to share from a family council perspective on the same topic. Just like residents need the safety and privacy of residents council meetings, so too do families at a family council meeting. So this leads into family council membership. So. Council mem family council membership is defined as a resident or a family, a family member of a resident or a person of importance to a resident is entitled to be a member of the family council of a long-term care home. So that's a family member of a resident, which is simple to understand. 
but also a person of importance to a resident. And this is a little less obvious perhaps, but what this has been taken to mean by the ministry and other stakeholders is that person of importance allows for people who are important to the life of a resident, but don't meet the strict definition of family. So a non-family substitute decision maker or another person who supports that resident and is integrated into that person's life. Person of importance also has been taken to mean that it allows for continued membership. Now that would be a case where there's a family council member whose resident passes away. As long as it's within the provisions of the terms of reference of that family council, that member can remain on the council as they fit the definition of a person of importance. So it's important to understand that continued membership is permissible and that person of importance allows for a broader membership within the council. However, that being said, the legislation also outlines a list of people who may not be a member of the council. That's the home licensee, administrator, other staff person, person employed by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Now, council membership, so family member of a resident, person of importance, that's subject to the list of who cannot be a member. So even if there's a staff person of the home who also has a loved one in that home, they cannot be members of the council. So it's strictly for family members and not for staff of the home. And that's because it's important for families to have a private confidential space to engage in peer support, doing, the, doing that learning about issues affecting their resident and their, themselves as caregivers on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. And it, they also need time and space to discuss concerns and recommendations for improving care and life within the home. Again, this can only be done on a peer-to-peer -peer basis because families may not feel comfortable discussing their concerns in front of staff or residents. That being said, like resident councils, family councils do often invite staff or others to attend meetings in order to share and receive information and may invite residents council members or leaders when appropriate. But in either case, an expressed invitation needs to be made in order to protect the safe, confidential space of a family council meeting. Now that we've explored how councils are similar and different, we're going to talk about how do you bridge that gap between the councils? And that is largely done through effective communication. So how can family council members learn about the residents council and vice versa? Sam and I have put our heads together and we've come up with a few ideas here, but it's certainly not an exhaustive list. Firstly, reviewing posted meeting minutes from each other's meetings might be a good place to start. Some councils even have established practices in place for sharing copies of approved meeting minutes between the councils to keep each group in the loop. As Sam also mentioned on occasion, a council might extend an invitation to have a representative from the other council attend or present an update at their respective meeting. Another great way to learn and to share is to arrange to have resident leaders and family council members meet between meetings through ongoing informal meetings or you may choose to formalize this process and form a subcommittee for knowledge translation and for collaboration between the councils. This may or may not require the assistance of the council assistant or the home's administrator. Ultimately, that's up to the councils to, um, to agree upon the nature of support they need in order to make that happen effectively. Other ideas include an event like a resident and family education night. So this would be something where representatives from each council would have an information booth or present on the roles and initiatives of the councils. This would give those groups an opportunity to hear from one another, but it would also be a really great opportunity to work together to educate and inform other residents, families and staff within the home. 
be a great way to share that you're working on aligned goals and to discuss the different things that your groups are working on. Another great opportunity for working together as the two councils, but also working on your aligned goals would be something like having resident and family involvement on the home quality or advisory committee. That would ensure that both those resident and family perspectives are represented on these internal committees and would again really center those voices, those lived experiences of families and residents to ensure that you're all working together on, towards the same goals and that staff, residents and families have a really deep understanding of those lived experiences. So now that we've explored how councils are similar and different and some of those effective communication strategies, we're going to put those theories into practice through our long-term care home-based learning scenario. So in this scenario, which is fictionalized, but also based on our, our real experiences as FCO and OARC, it's gonna be a 180 bed long-term care home located in the Barrie area. At this home, both residence council and family council are established. Residence council has 25 residents that attend regularly and family council has 10 what they call active members. Residence council is focusing on fundraising, enhancing resident quality of life and educational opportunities. Family council is focused on peer support for members guest speakers to, for educational opportunities, activity planning, and committee involvement within the home. Oops. So as, as you are likely aware, every home must develop a continuous quality improvement plan, and resident council and family council members have the right to know which areas the home is focusing on and be involved in the process of identifying those priority areas or goals. In our fictitious scenario that Sam just set up, we have a situation where a special whole home operational planning day has been organized to involve the stakeholders in the home, bringing together residents, families, team members, leaders in the home, contracted service providers, corporate consultants, everyone's coming together to help identify key quality areas that will eventually help to form the basis of the future quality improvement initiatives in the home and they might even be captured in the home's formal quality improvement plan or quip in our case study this experience of joining operational planning is new for the family council member participants but residents have been attending this event for the previous few years the home's administrator and some of the department heads have start off the day by pro providing some contextual information. They provide an overview of quality measures to all participants. So they're looking at the home's inspection reports, satisfaction survey results from the previous year, as well as honing in on quality indicator scores for the home, which will show how the home has performed compared to others within the province or maybe even within their, their, their organization. So two of the lower scoring areas that emerged in our fictitious scenario uh, as areas for improvement were activity program offerings, specifically on weekends, and the quality of hairdressing and dental services. So in the second half of the operational planning exercise, all participants were divided into mixed stakeholder groups with at least one resident and one family member at each table. And each group was tasked with one quality area to focus on for their discussion. The group discussing the weekend activity offerings on recreation calendars uh, was not surprisingly especially passionate. And it quickly became evident that the resident council member and family council members in the group had different perspectives on how to address the challenge of improving weekend programming. The family member in this case focused on the number of activity offerings. They were scrutinizing 
uh, a calendar and feeling that there was not enough programs on the calendar. From a resident's point of view, they were expressing that they were too many group programs and they would prefer to be seeing smaller programs on each home area. After some discussion and with the help of some effective facilitation skills from the team leader supporting the group, they came to understand that the residents and families, as well as team members, really wanted the same outcome. They want residents to have opportunities and activities that are meaningful and engaging and that enhance quality of life in the home. Like Melissa said, through a discussion, it was it became evident that families and resident council members actually wanted the same thing. They just had different perspectives on how to go about achieving that outcome. But when they worked together, they were able to come up with some really valuable insights and recommendations. They found common ground. So what they did, what they suggested to improve quality for weekend programming was that instead of offering multiple large group programs on weekends, which are more human resources intensive, as they usually require two to three team members to run, they suggested considering a trial of smaller group programs throughout the home. So it's still enhancing the weekend programming, but meeting the resident needs and interests of smaller groups. Further, there was a suggestion that with some redistribution of staff resources and creative problem solving, team members would be in a better position to meet the needs of residents and to reimagine possibilities to meet those needs and wants. So they thought about doing limiting activities to one large group program per day. So in this fictitious scenario, to further enhance the offerings, a family member involved in the discussion also offered to volunteer to run a small group program on Sunday afternoons to help supplement future activity offerings. So these groups found common ground, realized that they were actually wanting the same thing, but through bringing their perspectives, insights, and ideas together, they were able to come up with some recommendations that were really meeting everyone's needs and achieving what they wanted. So what can we take away from this scenario? What are the tips that you can put into practice to really work well together as family council and residence council? It is necessary to understand and respect the differences in opinion between the residence council and family council. And I think we've been really driving this forward. While each group brings something important to the table, from a resident's perspective, family council members need to listen to the lived experiences of residents. The long-term care home is their home 24 seven. They are the experts by their lived experience. On the other hand, residents can appreciate uh, that and they can respect the skills and the expertise that family members are bringing to the table in discussions when they, when they share. And then when family council gets involved in these discussions, they can bring really valuable outside perspectives. So they can bring their creativity, skill and expertise from a lens that is both resident and family focused. So respecting that the long term care home is the 24 seven home of the residents of their loved ones. Family Council can work together to augment that. So, because family members can often also act as a liaison between the home and broader community, they can identify opportunities to bring those skills and op skills, expertise, programmings, initiatives into the home. But it needs to be rooted in the resident and family focused experience in order to ensure that how they carry out their work is based in the residents' needs. So if we revisit our fictitious scenario, both councils have come to the realization that the outcome they'd like to achieve is the same. They want to enhance the resident and family experience by trialing new approaches to programming as more of a long-term goal. 
they have decided they've also decided to add on to that to have the councils come together to help supplement and enhance current programming offerings throughout the year for example there was one family member who was willing to volunteer and run a music program on the home area once a week it's worth noting that after participating in an exercise like the operational planning day several family member participants shared that they now had a better understanding of home operations and they came away with new knowledge of some of the behind the scenes quality work that is being done on an ongoing basis so if your home hasn't currently uh, had an opportunity to implement something like an operational planning day i would really urge you um, to explore this possibility to really engage your stakeholders in some hands-on learning and discussion. So residents and families in our scenario both expressed that the participation in the full, uh, full day operational planning also helped them to develop better relationships with the leadership team and other team members within the home. They were able to put faces to names, and gain a better understanding of various department roles and responsibilities, which is a real added bonus for council and home relations beyond that, that day experience. One of the commitments that came out of the experience was the decision by the Family Council and Residence Council to collaborate on a summer event to help celebrate Seniors Month in June. It was determined that the councils would plan and co-host a barbecue with live entertainment and a guest speaker. A formal planning committee was chaired by a representative from each council and was made up of volunteer representatives from the resident council and family council, as well as the staff assistant and other volunteers. In the initial planning meeting, there was lots of discussion about what each council and their individual members could contribute based on their interests, their strengths and available resources both community resources and resources within the home. For example, the assistants and other volunteers helped to promote the event within the home and within the external community. Family council members offered to secure donations for supplies and prizes. And the resident council through past fundraising initiatives, they had money in the bank and they wanted to sponsor the entertainment for the day. Those are just a few of the examples of brainstorming the tasks, and working as a group to delegate accordingly, again, based on interests and strengths. What made this collaboration work so well was the ongoing communication that occurred between the councils. So this wasn't a one meeting and then running the event. It was ongoing. They were committed to meet regularly outside of their respective meetings on this planning committee. They were conscientious about finding ways for everyone to participate in meaningful ways and match individuals to the tasks of interest and they stayed true to their shared goal by putting on a successful event for everyone in the home to enjoy as we've established family council and residence council are separate distinct groups that need their own safe space but we've also clarified that there's no prohibition in the long-term care homes act for working together in fact, we encourage you to seek opportunities for collaboration. Given the shared goal of improving care and life in the home and the different perspectives, skills and talents that each council can bring to the table, when you look for them, when you seek those opportunities, there are lots of opportunities to collaborate. So be open to ongoing opportunities for collaboration and cross promotion of council initiatives ideas that we've come up with are collaborating for fundraisers or events. For example, a new resident and family welcome social event, an opportunity for both groups to welcome their new community members. There could also be an opportunity to do a joint staff appreciation event. So thank, saying thank you to the folks who work hard day in and day out to make long-term care a wonderful place to live, visit and work. It could also be a special occasion like a seniors month event or an annual drive, something target specific or an event for the holidays or summer. As well, you can think about specific quality improvement projects within the home. For example, an indoor outdoor building enhancement, which Melissa is going to talk a little bit more about. 
so I really wanted to, to showcase a real life example. So it's not just us using a fictitious situation. This actually this effective collaboration is happening. I uh, this particular story was shared by Carolyn Snow, who is an OARC board director and the president of the Residence Council at Cedar Vale Lodge Care Community in Keswick. Last summer, the residents and families at Cedar Vale came together with a shared goal. They wanted to refresh the outdoor patio spaces that had been largely underutilized due to the elements and years of wear and tear. What really got the ball rolling was an invitation to the resident council president, Carolyn, to attend and speak at a family council meeting. At this point in time, the residents had already started to tackle a small patio project to enhance the smaller courtyard area, but the large outdoor space still needed a lot of work. Together, the councils agreed to collaborate on a quality improvement initiative to enhance this outdoor space for residents, team members, and visitors to the home. To ensure the success of the project, there was ongoing consultation between family, council, resident council, as well as the home's leadership, because they also need to be kept in the loop and they wanna be supportive partners in this kind of collaboration. What I really liked to hear was that residents were being consulted and viewed as the experts. Where did they want to see the plants in the garden? What kind of plants did you want annuals or perennials in the garden? The residents um, were deferred to, to make those kind of decisions, as well as decisions about the decor. Using personal connections, family members were able to obtain some new patio sets and benches. The residence council also wanted to support this initiative and they decided to put some of their resident council funds towards purchasing additional furniture and cushions to match the contributions of family members. So really on a balmy sun, summer day, we had a big patio cleanup and patio uh, uh, planting day that resulted in a transformed patio space. You can kind of see the process in these beautiful pictures that were shared by Cedarville. Uh, both councils were, were happy to share this experience with us. And so the outcome was strengthened relationships within the home, as well as a highly functional outdoor space that was enjoyed by everyone and a project that people took pride in. So there's an ongoing commitment to maintain this space as a quality area in, in this particular care community. So job well done. As we've explored through our fictionalized scenario and the real life example of the collaboration spotlight at Cedarvale Lodge, wonderful things can happen when families and residents in partnership with staff work together to achieve a common goal. But we'd be remiss if we didn't mention or touch on the fact that conflict can arise in any situation or scenario when you have a group of people working together there's an opportunity for conflict but let's switch that around a bit just like water crashing on rocks can erode the rocks it can also bring valuable nutrients that support life and growth Conflict can be beneficial. It can provide a really important opportunity to unpack differences in opinions and perspectives. So what needs, values, opinions, you know, personal histories are involved here? To really manage conflict, we need the tools to do so. So seek ways to build capacity for both residents and families. Now that could be self-directed learning through books, workshops, peer-to-peer -peer learning, etc. It could be an opportunity as well to work on something together because we need to try to get to the root of the conflict. So what's really going on here? In the scenario that we explored, families and residents wanted the same thing, but they had different ideas of how to go about enhancing the weekend programming. In an example like that, We'd want to explore why one idea or another was important to families or residents. Why do they think that's the way to go? And what's the root of the conflict? Because when we explore that, we get to know each other better and we can also ultimately resolve a conflict and achieve the best possible outcome. 
So when we keep in mind the goals of excellent quality of care in life and resident family and staff experiences, we can unpack that conflict, understand what everyone's bringing to the table and achieve those goals and come out with something that is quite wonderful, whether it's programming or a beautiful outdoor space. It's only through working together to unpack those differences that we can resolve conflict and come up with something that's going to meet everyone's needs. So Sam and I, as an extension of this, have come up with, we've identified some best practices for councils in order to work together. Firstly, as we discussed, it's imperative that boundaries are maintained and respected between the groups. When communication does occur, it's important to be mindful about how you're communicating, how you're coming off to others. Communicating with kindness and respect is really the best practice. To, to create an environment where the sharing of ideas is encouraged. And when you are talking to one another, use clear and appropriate language. It's also helpful to understand the differences between individual or personal issues and separate those from collective issues and identify strategies for how and when to share with the other council while maintaining that confidentiality that we highlighted earlier. Establishing practices for, for when and how to share information and updates. Now, I know we touched on this idea earlier. There's lots of ways to do this. You, uh, the sharing of approved meeting minutes or agendas sharing memos or updates back and forth and having a commitment to meet between meetings whether that's uh, some volunteers or part of the resident council and family council leadership teams keeping each other in the loop is a great way to foster great working relationships in summary what we've explored through this webinar really brings home the fact that both residents and family councils are integral to long-term care homes. Residents councils provide space and privacy and confidentiality for residents to gather together as peers to support one another, learn and share ideas. Family councils were developed in order to provide families with those same opportunities to come together as caregivers and explore their experiences, learn about issues affecting their loved ones, and provide an opportunity for families to contribute to the life of residents. However, we do need to keep in mind that these perspectives are different, but both valuable. The perspectives of families won't be the same as residents, but they're both important in enhancing the quality of care and life of a long-term care home. What else is both important but different is legislation. So the legislation is similar, but there are a few key differences. So it's important to be aware of and mindful of that. We need to keep those safe spaces to provide those private times for families and for residents to speak together as peers, but seek opportunities to collaborate explore ways that you can work together on aligned goals and support your different but often similar perspectives and needs. Manage conflict as it arises. Conflict is normal. It's going to happen in any time where a group of people gather together. But what matters the most is to manage it as it arises because it doesn't go away. Above all, Focus on respect for yourselves in your roles and each other. Communicate with kindness. Communicate, act, and carry out your work with kindness. And communicate regularly. You have a great opportunities as families and residents council members and staff supporting them to do incredible things within your home. But it's only through collaboration, respect, kindness, and communication that you'll be able to do your best work. Excellent. Well, at this time, we'd like to open up the lines or the chat box to um, explore any questions that, that participants on the call today have for either Sam or myself. 
Hi, everyone. It's Josie Lee here. We do have a question that just come through through the chat box. They are asking, as some family members bring their loved ones to the family council meeting, is this allowed or encouraged? So I'll take that one, um, speaking from the Family Council perspective. It's not specifically prohibited in legislation, but we don't encourage it as a best practice. The reason being, and while we understand that attending a Family Council meeting requires someone to step away from those that time spent with their loved ones, having residents be at a Family Council can be problematic because families may not feel comfortable sharing their questions, their concerns, and their challenges in front of a resident. For example, let's say that a resident um, has been having issues with incontinence supplies and a family wants to talk about that uh, at a family council meeting. That family likely won't want to be talking about those personal issues in front of a resident's peer. And in fact, it's not appropriate because this is a resident's personal issue and shouldn't be shared with other residents without permission. So it's not expressly prohibited in legislation, but it's not a good idea because we want to make sure that families have their spa safe space to talk about their issues that's also respectful of their resident. Thanks, Samantha. We have another question that just came in. Um, they stated that they have a resident who also has a family member in the home. Can that resident be a member of family council? In terms of legislation, it's a bit of a gray area. What we'd say as best practice is that their role as a, as a resident council member would supersede the family council involvement. So best practice would be that the resident is a member of residence council. However, as we've explored throughout this webinar, there are lots of opportunities and ways to share information between those groups. So my recommendation would be the resident goes to residence council and between resident and family council, there would be processes and mechanisms established for sharing information between the two groups that also would meet the interests and the, the desires of that resident to know what's going on at, in family council. Another question was around who can act as a mediator in case of unresolved conflict between Family Council and Residence Council? I mentioned earlier that the administrator does play that critical role of setting the tone in the home. So if the council members were open to the idea, the administrator might um, help get representatives of the councils together to discuss using some of the conflict management strategies that Sam touched on. Um, you might have the involvement of the assistants who would get take when the assistant is acting in their capacity as assistant to either council, they are taking off their management hat or their their connection to the home and they are acting on behalf of the council and taking direction from the council. So you wouldn't, wouldn't want the council assistant to be um, put in a, an uncomfortable position, but they also have a lot of skills um, in terms of facilitation and problem solving when running their own respective meetings with the council leaders. So it might, it might, the conflict management might look very different from home to home and from council to council. It would really depend on the nature of the conflict. If this was more of a systems or home operations conflict, then, then someone from the home might be uh, helpful in this case. Um, Sam, do you have anything to add to that? In some cases, uh, depending on who's acting as staff assistant to council, there may also be a uh, another social worker or social service worker available in the home who could provide some outside perspective. Family council members have identified that it's often the social worker or the social service worker who has skills and expertise in facilitating difficult conversations and who can act as a resource in a situation like that. Often for mediation in regards to conflict, we'd want it to be uh, a neutral party who has the skills and expertise to facilitate conflict. 
course, that's not always possible. We're not all skilled conflict negotiators, but I would look to the resources available within the home, whether it's the administrator or staff assistant to counsel, if appropriate and requested, or another staff person like a social worker or a social service worker who'd be able to help with that process. I see that OAR, OARC's president, Sharon Cook, also advised that if maybe if, there, if their conflict was around uh, the legislation or needing clarification on something, OARC and Family Councils Ontario, we're always available to you to help you through and to give you tools to support you through these kinds of discussions and problem solving. Absolutely. I do recognize that we are at 3.30. Perhaps I can just um, pose one more question to Melissa and one more to Samantha that has come in through the chat box. Uh, one for Samantha is, is it okay to have more members of family councils that their loved ones have passed away than those members that currently have their loved ones in the home? Continued membership is a frequently asked question that we get, and that's what applies to, to this question. So that in that example where it's the balance between family members with residents currently in the home versus those who have passed, there's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, answer to that. You want people on your council who have a stake in the home, who know what's going on, who have a good connection to the life of that home. It's ultimately up to the council to decide what that's going to look like. So it's okay. There's no rule against it, not even necessarily a best practice. What's important is that it works for that council and for that home and that everyone is engaged in the life of that home and understands what's what's going on. For more questions or information about that topic, please feel free to contact us directly as we do have resources and materials available. Great. And lastly, Melissa, uh, we have a comment here. Given that residents are supposed to feel that they can speak freely, do you think it is a good idea to have a staff member as the residence council assistant? This is a, a very good question. Um, and I think Sam spoke very briefly about how the assistant is assigned. It's, it is the staff assistant is, is typically appointed by the home's administrator, but this is done through a negotiated process. So it is imperative that residents on the council have feedback in the selection process, we want to make sure that the assistant who has been selected is the right fit. And I've certainly supported councils that have undergone transitions when the, the staff assistant was not, not the right fit. It, uh, it's, it's very important for those meetings to be maintained as safe spaces um, that there is trust and transparency um, and they're feeling that the assistant is acting uh, in their capacity in a respectful way with the council. Um, so, of course, if there's been a conflict of interest or a challenge with this particular staff member, um, then then perhaps there this could open the door for discussions with the administrator in terms of selecting somebody else who might be a better fit. Also, this is an opportunity to ask the residence council, what are the qualities you'd like to see in a staff assistant? Is there someone on our in the team in the home that you would like to be acting as the assistant and perhaps approach someone on that in that way? Uh, but it is typically a staff member because at the end of the day, there's the accountability that the administrator can oversee and make sure that they are fulfilling. Uh, the assistant is fulfilling their responsibilities to council. You get into gray areas when there's volunteers and people, external parties acting as the assistant. So again, as Sam said, if there's some follow up to that question or any others that we didn't touch on, I do encourage you to reach out to us. Our, our contact info is on this last slide here. And a big thank you to Josie Lee for acting as our um, facilitator organizer of today's webinar. And to my counterparts, Samantha, for joining me in this collaboration with OARC on this very I'm... friendly topic. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm, we're, I'm so happy to be involved in this to help bring forward these ideas and these common misconceptions and really support effective collaboration between family and residence councils.
Excellent. Today's webinar has been recorded, as Josie Lee mentioned. So if there's um, someone in your home or perhaps the councils um, weren't able to tune in today, we strongly encourage you to uh, share the link that will be emailed out to all participants and on our respective websites so that you can listen and share this content in the future. Thanks for joining everyone. Have a great afternoon.